Okay, good evening, everybody. Simon Jacobson here. I welcome you. Congratulations. I hear, uh, I saw love in your eyes, but now I want to especially wish you Mazel Tov. Okay. I have inside information. I just want to make sure you don't think I'm a prophet or something. Uh, and uh, I welcome everyone for another evening, another episode in the continuing adventures of Wednesday Night Live. <laughs> um, and tonight's topic is uh, healthcare reform of a different sort, as we shall see. <clears throat> I want to begin by saying that the class is dedicated graciously by Mark Belinsky in honor of his father's Ben-Sian um, Ben-Yitzchok on the fourth of, video, of year, his grandfather's, I think, yard site. And the class is also dedicated by Miriam Glazer in honor of her mother's yard site, Frida Glazer, on the first of uh, ER, which is now. We enter the new month of ER, the Hebrew month of ER, which I shall discuss in a moment. I also want to say right at the outset, because it's something that people have been asking me about, you'll see these sheets up front, and we sent out an email last night uh, by popular demand, those of you familiar with the book, uh, the Omer book that I have written. So I'm going to be doing a four-part in-depth uh, webinar, they call it, which means online, seminar online, which will be broadcast online. We'll probably also maybe doing it live here, just confirming that. It begins Sunday night, uh, 8 o'clock, Sunday, April 18th. I'm sorry, no. <laughs> I'm getting everything wrong here. Let's start again. Uh, April 25th. April 25th, Sunday evening. I'll do it at 8 o'clock. But it's all going to be recorded, so in case you can't make it, it will be available um, afterwards. There is a, a fee for it, but there's a special early bird. It also comes with be a, a, a pretty comprehensive study guide that goes along with it, with exercises. It really goes beyond the book into going more in depth into so-called our emotional building blocks which is what we explore and examine and um, and uh, refine in this 49-day uh, period, period between Passover and Shavuot. So if you know the book or the Omer book, you know what I'm talking about. Even if you don't, this will be self-standing. You don't have to know the book in order to participate. So if something that you're interested in, there's like more information on the sheet. It's pretty, uh, it should be pretty cool. And there's going to be four Sundays, consecutive Sundays meaning every, after the 25th on May 2nd, May 9th, and May 16th, all the way till the Sunday before the holiday Shavuot. And each week I'll be discussing and exploring in depth. The first week will be the state of uh, the first two of the emotions, love and discipline. The second will be uh, compassion and, um, and uh, fortitude or ambition. The third week I'll be focusing on um, humility and bonding. And the fifth week will be Malchut, the final of the seven spheres, Dignity. It's really basically the emotional, um, the spectrum of our emotional lives, as according to the Kabbalah, the mystics breaks into these seven components. And when you look at each one specifically in detail, you can get a very interesting uh, new perspective on yourself. That's why we call it discover yourself in a new way. Anyway, so that's a plug for this uh, Omer seminar. And, uh, and of course, the book is available if you want to check it out. It's here. We also send out a daily email. A uh, reminder, okay, I think enough with the announcements. Um, let's get to the subject matter. And subject matter, as I said, is the Kabbalah of Healing, the more official title. Unofficial is, uh, is health care reform. And the reason the topic for this week is because we now enter, as I mentioned briefly before, um, the Hebrew month of Ear. So if you're familiar with the Hebrew months, which are basically lunar months. The, the Hebrew calendar as opposed to the Gregorian calendar that we use is a, um, is a uh, lunar calendar, which means it works by, follows the cycles of the moon, meaning the full moon is a, I'm sorry, the new moon is the first of the month, which is right now. We're entering the new month of year. The 15th of the month would be the full moon, the seventh of the month is the first quarter, and like the, more or less the twenty-fifth of the month would be the third quarter. 
So if you look at the sun, you look at the moon and its uh, and its particular shape, you can tell more or less what day in the month we are in the lunar calendar. And that's the Hebrew months follow that calendar. So now we call it the beginning of the second month, because in the Jewish calendar, when you count by the months, the first month is the month the Jews left Egypt, and then which was last month, the month of Nisan, when we celebrated Passover, and now begins the next month. It's called Ear. In the Bible, the names of the months are by date, are by uh, number. So month one, month two, month three, and so on. Um, but in other places, in the Tanakh and other places, the Nach, there is a reference to names. Ear is the name for this month. Now, the word Ear, um, usually the names are connected to our Babylonian names, Persian names. Um, but they have different meanings in them. And Ear happens to have an acronym. The word Ear in Hebrew is made up of four Letters or two or three letters, Aleph Yud Yud Resh, or sometimes written Aleph Yud Resh, which is an acronym in Hebrew for a verse in the Bible that says Ani Hashem Refecha. So the Aleph is Ani, I, Hashem is a Yud Yud, God's name, God. Refecha is your healer. I, God, your healer, is a verse in the book of Exodus where it talks about the power of healing. And the expression used is, I, God, I'm, the, I'm your healer. Which is an interesting discussion on its own. What does that mean exactly? You know, Most people would attribute healing to healers as in humans. Doctors, practitioners, quacks, whatever you want to call them. But uh, healers of all sorts, some legitimate, some not legitimate. I mean, we have many different categories of healers. So, but nevertheless, the Bible puts... Praises it, I got him your healer. So, therefore, the month of year is associated with healing. And that's not coincidental that the fact that the counting of the Omer that I just referred to in uh, the seminar I'm doing, the webinar, and this book is in this period of time because year from beginning to end is all about the counting. So, if you're familiar with this period of time in that sense, it's not just about counting numbers, it's really a, a, an intense period of personal refinement and character development. So on the second day of Passover, the custom is, we begin uh, called the mitzvah of counting the Omer. In the times of the temple, that day there was a certain offering brought. And the, and the Bible says, in the book of Leviticus, uh, shabbos, fartem lechem shabbos, you shall count from the second day, referring to the second day of Passover, from the day when you bring the Omer, which was a particular barley offering in the, in the a measurement. Uh, Omer is a certain measurement of a barley offering in the temple. And the day after that, you shall begin to count, and you shall count, it says, seven weeks, uh, seven times seven weeks, meaning seven days, seven weeks, is 49 days. And on the 50th day, this is an actual verse in the Bible, will be the holiday of Shavuot. That's the way it's described. So, technically, you could say the counting, purely based on the verse, is just a matter of figuring out when the holiday comes. So for, Shavuot is always 49 days or 50th day after, Pas after the second day of Passover. But obviously there's deeper meaning to this because it turns into a mitzvah. Once in a year, these 49 days we actually count every evening after the uh, evening service. The mitzvah is, the custom is to actually, uh, in, the back of the, in, the, in, the, in the prayer book you'll find a blessing that's made where we count. In the back of this book it's, it's quoted. We actually count with a blessing and we say each night has its particular number. And we also add a particular attribute. So, in different commentaries discuss what is the significance of this counting. One of them discusses it in context that when the Jews left Egypt, in great anticipation of receiving the Torah at Sinai, they began to count. They were told that 50 days from now will be the revelation at Sinai. So they were told that, and therefore, when you're excited about something, you start counting. But obviously, if you think about it, counting is much more than just purely adding up numbers. But there's something more about it. So in Hebrew, the word for sfartem, the word sfartem, which means to count, also has other meanings. For instance, sfartem means misper, number, but it also means sipur, tell a story. In Hebrew... I mean, there are different ways that we use the words telling a story. There's like, where the Haggadah, Passover, we also tell the story. There the word is Haggadah, Lahagid. Haggadah to the Vincha. But there's also the Saper. The Saper Yitzhiz Mitzrayim, Sipur. 
Sipur is usually the word for, for is another word used for story. There's another, there's some other words used for story as well. So the word Vesfartim can also be defined as telling the story of these 49 days. And then, then it has yet another meaning. And another meaning would be the meaning of, uh, from the word uh, sapphire, the sapphire stone. In Hebrew, a sapphire stone is a sapir, like sapphire, sapphire. So the sapphire can also be defined as, as shining or glowing like the sapphire. Um, so, and finally, and maybe the root of it all, is originates in the mystical teachings, which, you may, uh, is, which is known as that the emanations or the way that God, divine energy, manifests in existence is through what we call divine emanations. They're called the spheres, the spherot. So like a shining sphere, each emanation... Um, expresses yet another divine form of energy that manifests in this universe. So there are overall seven, ten spheres. The ten break down into two groups, a group of three and a group of seven, meaning, making ten. The group of three are more the intellectual faculties, so-called manifestations on the cognitive level, and the seven are the emotional. The focus in the sphere of Omer, which I'm not going, going to go into detail now, is on the seven. So that's where the seven weeks come from in the seven times seven, 49. So essentially you can then say, based on this, that the word Svartim takes on a whole different dimension. It's not just about counting uh, seven days, 49. It's about uh, manifestation, experience, that during this period we actually uh, tell the story of our souls. We experience our souls. And we um, work upon what's called in, the, in Hebrew would be called birar hamidot, or the refinement of a person's emotions, a person's internal psyche, which consists of these seven emotions, seven times seven, with each week focusing on another one of these dimensions. So if you look in a siddur, in a prayer book, you'll find at the end of each, uh, I'm sorry, at the mitzvah of each day when we count each evening, you'll find, it, it could be cryptic, you'll find a reference to the words uh, Chesed Sheba Chesed would be the first night of the counting. The next night is Gvur Sheba Chesed. I'll translate that in a moment. Then it's Tefer Sheba Chesed. And when you finish the first week of Chesed, of love, comes the next week of Gvura. So each week focuses on one of the seven emotions, and each day of that week focuses on a detail within that particular emotion. So what you come out, what, you, what, what this results in is a fascinating, really, like, map of our psyche. And the Torah doesn't mince words in saying that just as you go to a doctor to get an x-ray of your body, if you need that, or something, let's say, you have something that's not perfect, God forbid, but if that's the situation, sometimes the naked eye cannot always see it. So you take an x-ray or a CAT scan that's able to see a little more than behind the scenes, so in a certain way, you can say when the Bible says we were all created in the divine image, we too have a soul, a psyche, an inner, you could say the inner workings of our beings, and it's made up of pieces as well, components. They're obviously not tangible and physical components, they're called more spiritual components. But, just, but, uh, the, but well, bottom line is just like there's the mind at work, there's the heart at work, our feelings are not just general feelings, we have feelings of love, can, we have feelings of we can be we can be drawn to something we can be repulsed we can be repulsed by something we can have feelings of compassion uh, empathy so the Torah describes that these seven emotions we say it every day in the prayers as well especially when we take out the Torah and the Torah is called the Cha Hashem Hagdula Hagvura and so on we define seven different attributes which really are seven attributes that each of us have. And they're completely different. They can be very, They actually need each other to complement each other for us to be complete human beings. So the classic example I'll give is, uh, for instance, love. So everyone, no one would deny that love is a may, most necessary, maybe the most necessary, important component in a person's life. It may not be so obvious as we grow into adults, but as children, love is like water to a, to a garden. Without it, without the nurturing and the warmth and the and the comfort the validation that comes from love, a person's spirit can be deeply stifled. God forbid, children growing up without that, you can see it. When Ultimately, those that grow up with it, like anything that's healthy, healthy things are not always that obvious 
we take it for granted. Like, what does it feel like to be healthy? If you can answer that question, there's a problem. Health shouldn't feel like anything. If you feel something, a sensation, it usually means that something is not working. You know, so it should just be breathing smoothly. Your heart should just be functioning. You shouldn't be feeling it. It should just be happening. But usually we can see the beauty of something when you see when one is, God forbid, deprived of it. When you're deprived, you suddenly see someone struggling, God forbid, for a breath, for every breath in a hospital. You suddenly realize breathing is not such a simple matter. If you think about it from a medical point of view, the odds of a healthy breathing person is, is quite miraculous, actually. The meant so many factors that have to come together to work properly. <clears throat> so this is part of appreciating the inner workings of our lives. So this period between Passover and Shavuos is an intense period of healing, you can say. And then, that, therefore, the connection to Ir as Ani Hashem Rofecha, the acronym, I, God, am your healer, that's a month of healing. But healing should not always be understood in the context, and usually we talk about healing, we think of it like healing is the absence, is fighting illness. There are two types of Rufua from a Jewish point of view. Yes, there's a Rufua, meaning a medicine, a healing that comes uh, in order to counter an illness, a disease, a problem, God forbid. But there's another, there's a thing called uh, healthy maintenance, the thing called preventive medicine. Health doesn't, just like shalom in Hebrew, the word for peace, is not just the absence of war. Rafua, health, is not just the absence of illness. There's a healthy state of mind, a healthy heart, a healthy attitude, a healthy way we function. And uh, it's not just the absence of disease. So when we talk about this month, we're not just talking about healing from problems, even though we all have our share of them. It's also about um, called reinforcing the forces within our psyches, within our spirits that make us healthy human beings. So I think it's appropriate, as we enter this month of year, to talk about this theme, this topic, because of its power, the power of this healing power of, of uh, this month. In Judaism, time is not just a invisible force, it actually is a form of energy. It uh, gives us abilities, a power. The night of the Seder, like someone asked me the question, why can't I do, I can't do a Seder on Passover night, can I do a Seder after Passover? I said, technically, yeah, you can sit on the table and eat matzah and drink wine and, and, and do the whole thing. But what's missing, what's missing is that you're missing the time element. There's a window of opportunity that night. Uh, as the Arizal says, Hayomim ha'el and iskarim v'nasim, Something actually happens. Whether we feel it or not is another story. But doing, doing the customs of Passover a day before, a day after, may have some meaning and technically, but it doesn't have the power. You know, like you can, can you celebrate your birthday on another day of the year? Yeah, you can celebrate that you were born another day of the year. That's not your birthday. But the power of what a birthday is, that energy that enters into your being, into life, into existence, happens on that particular day. So in that sense, time is, time is like a cycle like a spiral, where every year when we come to Rosh Hashanah or, or Passover, or for that mon matter what we're discussing this evening year, there's some type of force that gives us more strength than during the rest of the year. That doesn't mean you can't access it any other time. God is accessible at any time, anywhere. But the fact is, in a synagogue, uh, and at the Kotel, for example, at holy places, uh, at holy moments, you, let's, let's put it this way, there are less layers that block and, and serve as obstacles between us and our inner uh, our souls and divine force and so on and so forth. So we have now a period which uh, mechanically it's about counting, yes, every night and counting and stating what number we're counting that night. But if you take it more personally, and psychologically, emotionally, it's actually a profound emotional uh, workover, you can say, um, exercises that actually force us to compel us to, uh, through introspection, to look at ourselves, to look at the different aspects of our lives. So just to give the classic example, uh, take love. As I said, love, everyone would agree, is an a, a indispensable force in life. In Hebrew, it's called chesed. Chesed, love. Yet love itself, we see, doesn't come easily. For some of us, love is very... Well, for some, for everybody, love is fraught with all kinds of challenges. I remember I was once invited to speak somewhere, and... Um, the host, the program director, called me and asked, you know, what, about the topic, what topic should we choose? So I, uh, they asked me, what are, the, what are the most popular topics that you, you pick up when you travel around there? So I said, it's usually topic number one is usually relationships, love, sexuality, marriage, 
And topic number two is pain and suffering. So I remember the program manager, the program director, telling me on the phone. I I, I thought I always thought there was all one topic, you know, those two. I saw them as two topics. So you could say there's a point to that, you know, if you're going to love somebody and be vulnerable, there's always the second uh, the second side of the coin, which means you can be hurt. If you feel you can find love in this world without the potential of being hurt, uh, good luck. It doesn't work that way. Um, because when you open yourself up and you love somebody, you're in a sensitive place, you're in a vulnerable place, and a opponent can be hurt. If you lock yourself up and don't let anyone in, and don't, let, uh, and, don't, and, don't, and, and don't allow yourself to enter another person's life, yeah, you may be safer, but love you'll not find. So love is not just about loving ourselves, it's about loving another. There's a certain... I don't want to use the word transcendent dimension to it. And I promise I wouldn't use that word because she's signing. <laughs> I don't know if there's a word for that. But fine, I'll sign for that. Um, so love doesn't come easily. And if you break down the seven components of love, meaning the first week when we count the Omer, you'll see, talking about healing, that when you break it down, you can start identifying where you're strong and where you're weak. For instance, in day two of the Omer, we said, What does that mean in simple English? Simple psychological terms. It means that you can love somebody. And what happens if you love them so much, you keep giving, 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 and you don't know when to stop. Parents can spoil their children this way. Even their spouses, even people who are adults that love each other. There has to be a measure of uh, called seasoned love, meaning a certain gvura. Not, God forbid, a gvura. Gvura is discipline in the sense of countering the love. It's channeling it. It's like when you're teaching someone, you can't just pour all every, everything you know. A teacher, a good teacher, is going to spoon feed. Not in a condescending way. Just simply articulate, communicate ideas in a way that the person who's receiving can receive. So love is not just about you giving. It's also about are you giving according to the containers of the person that can receive. And if you're not... We, get, we end up stuck in the place where the Talmud says in Tainus, it says when Chene uh, Hamagel, he was one of the great sages, and he was praying during a famine for rain, so the Talmud says, there's a whole story about it, but, 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 but uh, relevant to our discussion here, he finally got it to rain through his prayers. But, it's, but his prayers were too good, the Talmud says. In a sense, it started gushing so much rain that it flooded the fields. So then he went and went, had, a set, had, to, uh, had to offer a new set of prayers and he used the expression, Rev Teva, Eni Yechelem Lekabal, the Talmud says, the Gemara says. Too much good, we cannot receive. What happens when uh, there's a flood? Yes, you're getting a lot of water. The problem is it's coming down so quickly that it can destroy the fields. So the same water that was supposed to nurture the fields becomes worse than a famine in a way. It destroys the fields to the point that Everything that was planted is no longer is is is, is, is completely is completely wasted. So the so there's an expression called gvuras kshamim, which means the gvura of rain. You could say, well, rain is not gvura; rain is chesed. It's the bestowing of blessings from above. The rain that falls, that waters our fields, that 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 produces the the sustenance in our lives. Today we take for granted because we can buy anything anywhere. But, but the, it wasn't that simple. And even today, famines destroyed civilizations. No food, no, 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 no sustenance. So the key to rain is not just that it comes down, but it comes down in raindrops. If you think about it, that's the greater blessing, that God gives it to us in raindrops that can be absorbed by the earth, by the soil, drop by drop. And meanwhile, it absorbs it, so then another, it can, it can um, integrate it in a way that it becomes healthy and, and makes things grow. So you need gvura sheba chesed, basically. Chesed alone is, is beautiful, but without, without a certain, if you don't, with the gas, you need brakes. The brake is gvura. It's measuring, knowing, are you giving too much, too fast? Uh, maybe it's more about you're selfishly wanting to give instead of really realizing the other person can't receive what you want to give. So it can come from get very good intentions. I deal with this very often when you counsel people, relationships. It's a common thing. Sometimes people have a lot of love to give. And they forget or they don't realize that the other person may not be ready. Or the other person may not uh, have the same container. They may not have the same passion or the same even courage for that matter. So it's just, I'm not suggesting it's, it's simple. It's a question of 
discussing, recognizing that there are two people in a relationship, it takes two to tango, and recognizing that you need Gvura of Chesed. And the same as if you go down the line of each one of the seven emotions, you'll see there's the empathy within chesed, that's teferis of chesed. There's the endurance within love. For instance, you can love somebody, but as soon as it's un- inconvenient, or there's a challenge, you're out of there. You know, that's why you need netzach. Netzach is like endurance. It's a certain drive. You're ready to face obstacles. You're ready to deal with challenges in love. So you could have love, you don't have the netzach of love, or you don't have a strong netzach. Then there's the humility of love. That's pretty obvious. Love can be arrogant, it can be humble. Um, and then there's the other two, the final two, the bonding of love and the dignity of love. So years ago, when I gave this class, we weren't here, we were, uh, I think it was the Upper West Side, maybe it was even earlier than that. Maybe it was back in my home. Um, and I remember uh, someone here in this class began for the first time counting the Omer, during this period. And they came to these obscure words at the end of each blessing with many sitters. It says, like I said, chesed shebe chesed, gvur shebe chesed. And a person came over to me after the class and said, what do these words mean, Rabbi? And uh, to be honest, I had to tell him, I have no clue. <laughs> I mean, I knew a few of them. And uh, he looked at me and says, well, so what, do you, what have you been doing all these years? Like when you count them. I said, well, there's a thing called mechanical Judaism. <laughs> I grew up with it. You take it for granted. I read Hebrew. So it's easy for me, in a way. But he forced me to actually go back because I was embarrassed, to be honest. I was embarrassed. I didn't have an answer. I mean, I, as I said, I, you know, it's like many prayers. You say the prayer and you hope that God uh, has in mind everything you need. You don't always understand what you're saying, but that's what they've been saying from the beginning of time. The Book of Psalms, for example, which Jews have recited for, yeah, for millennia, especially in times of need, is not easy to understand. If you read it, you'll see. It's, it's a cryptic Hebrew. It's written in very difficult language. And uh, I, I, you know, I'm not saying this to be negative about anybody, but it's very hard for me to imagine how many people, when they read Tehillim, actually understand every word. I include myself in this, in this uh, category. Yet, we, we think, okay, we may not understand it, but God understands it. It's like calling out to your father, even though uh, you, you may not understand what you're saying, but you hope your father does or your mother does. And that has power. And, I'm not, and, and there's no question what I just said, it says in some of the holy books, that's true. But how much more powerful is it when you actually know what it means? So I went back and I did some research and I asked around. It took me time and I finally put together, it wasn't a booklet at the time, to be honest. I just gave out a handout of each night's so-called sphere, each night's emotion and the exercises involved. And I realized as, as we were going, it was really, as I said, you, you learn things more from your students sometimes than from your teachers. That's what the Talmud says as well. They asked the great sage, where did you learn what you know? He says, I learned much from Rabbi Saim and my teachers. I learned even more from my colleagues, Haverim. And, and, and I learned most from my students. You can wonder, well, the students know less than the teacher. Know less than the teacher's teacher. They know less than the teacher's colleagues. Why is it, what do you learn from your students you don't learn from your teachers? So it may not be the facts or the actual knowledge, scholarship, but what you learn from students is, number one, is you learn integrity. You learn uh, that type of sincerity that a student that is hungry for knowledge and information that you may take for granted, that person elicits something in you. Like, you know, you see suddenly an appreciation for ideas that you, you know, you, you, it's, a, it's a given. That's number one. Number two, when you have to actually communicate to, uh, to a student who may not be in your level, God made it in an interesting way that you have to reach deeper inside of yourself to communicate. They say about King Solomon, the wisest man, one of the expressions that used to define his, his wisdom was, Yimshel Shlema Shlesha Salafim Mashal. Shlema Melch, King Solomon, would find 3,000 metaphors, Mishalim, for a given idea. So the question is asked, what's so, you know, what's, that sounds very creative, but what's so brilliant about it? So one of the places, one book, one of the holy books writes that he didn't just give 3,000 metaphors and he was very innovative and found all kinds of metaphors. He actually was able to find 3,000 levels of metaphors, which means 3,000 levels beyond him. If you want to explain to a child an abstract idea, you have to find an example in the child's life. If you want to explain any abstract idea, you need to find some common denominator between yourself and the person teaching. Richard Feynman, the great physicist, was brilliant at that. Deceptively simple metaphors from some of the most complex, abstract concepts in physics. 
And when you look at it, it sounds like a simple metaphor, but then you, the brilliance of it is he was able to take an idea that, to the fact that he understood a concept that was abstract. Great, okay, a good mind can do that. But to find a metaphor that people who don't understand that concept can appreciate, that takes far greater uh, uh, wisdom. That's why, for instance, you may understand concepts in your mind. If someone were to ask you right now something you really have worked through and you really figured out, well, get up here right now, make a presentation and share it with us, you'll see it's not that easy. Because understanding it on your own terms is one thing. As soon as you have to communicate it to others, you'd think, well, that should be even easier because I don't have to tell them everything I know. You just tell them uh, the tip of the iceberg. Why isn't it that easy? Because that's not the way it is. As soon as you have to express outside of yourself, it requires you to dig deeper. And then to write it down is even harder. So as they say, machshava, dibur, amaisa. To think about an idea, a brilliant mind can come up with great ideas. To say it, explain it to others, requires more depth. We say, and, and to write it down in a way that's the written word requires even more depth. That's why writing creates a whole different dimension of comprehension than when you just understand it in your own. I mean, any of you have ever written a paper or anything? You know, that's how it is. That's why it's so difficult. But the end result is so much more crystallized. Saif Maisa, the Machshav Tchila, we say Friday night. That the end of the Maisa, the end, final end of the product, the end of the action, is rooted in Machshav Tchila, in the beginning of the deepest parts of the thought. So in order to create something in a real, tangible way, you have to go deeper within. So that's one of the reasons that when we teach, and, uh, and all of us have this capacity, you don't have to be an official teacher or an orator or a writer, but even communicating to someone that's not like yourself, someone that knows maybe a little less about, than you do about Judaism or about any particular topic, sharing, in that sense, besides what you give, that you're helping another understand something, it does for you perhaps more than what it does for them. As they say, about charity, there's a statement, a really interesting, uh, para- ironic statement actually, that more than what the person, the philanthropist is doing for the person who's giving charity, is the one that's giving, I'm sorry, the one that's receiving is doing more for the giver than the giver is doing for the receiver. I know, I hope you got that, it was a little complicated, but you got the idea. Um, so the point is that that uh, God created the world in an interesting way that sometimes to reach the, the, your own depths requires you to reach into another person's depths. Kamayim ha'panim l'panim, ken leva adam la'adam, it says in the book of Proverbs. As one heart is reflected, as, as the face is reflected in water, one heart is reflected in another. So there's a certain symbiotic relationship that we all have something to give to each other. That's why in Jewish law, for instance, a charity is not just for the wealthy, it's not just for the middle class. Even a pauper is supposed to give charity. Everyone according to their level. It's a sign of dignity. Everyone has something to give. Who is the wise person? The one who learns something from everyone. You could say, well, what, from everyone? I mean, there are people that seem to be not, don't have much to teach. If God created a human being on this earth, they have something to teach us. If we meet them, there's a reason for it. So all this is part of the process of these 49 days of healing, in a way, of looking into our own hearts, um, and also communicating with others, and all of it ends up becoming a deeper form of uh, growing. I mentioned of healing and growth. I mentioned healthcare reform is in the news, right? You hear about it all the time. Um, whether it's about insurance or it's about other forms of uh, legislation that's being passed, not being passed. You, know, you start reading the nitty gritty, the details, you realize all this reform is not happening in our lifetime basically like the next generation, something like that. Um, and then what will, will it be legislated, changed as, as the years roll on? You know, there's a lot of politics involved. In it. I'm not here to discuss my opinion on the matter. Frankly, I don't know enough to comment on it. I do know that um, lobbyists have a lot of power, and I know the pharmaceutical industry has even more power. So I'm generally cynical about a lot of things going on in Washington, but that aside, you know, this country has been a very benevolent country, especially to Jews, so we have to be thankful. It's not perfect. But it's a good opportunity, healthcare reform, to talk about going into the month of Ir, Ani Hashem Refecha, the acronym of Ir, Ani Hashem Refecha, I got him here, to talk about what, what exactly is healing and what is um, the true meaning of it all. You know, 
there's no question that medicine today is revolutionary to what it was just uh, even the last uh, few decades. Every day new breakthroughs, and it's astonishing what it has done. Diseases that once were thought unimaginable to be vanquished, today don't exist. Um, the life expectancy has gone up tremendously. Real numbers, but I think in the beginning of the 20th century, life expectancy was 47 for an average male. Today it's 70, 65, I don't know, know exact numbers. Huh? Am I off? Higher, okay. I'm, I'm, glad, I'm sorry, I should have said that. By Jews we say 120 is life expectancy. Uh, but um, uh, are you in the medical field? Okay. It's important to know because sometimes, I don't want to sound like an idiot speaking here. Sometimes I start to, So I'm making a big disclaimer. I'm neither a doctor nor a scientist. I've dabbled a little and read some of it. I'm a pundit. Okay, let's put it out. So, um, but bottom line is that medicine, no matter how you twist and turn it, is tremendously um, advanced and been an unbelievable blessing in our lives. It has its challenges, for sure, as today a society that has much more uh, senior citizens is going to be challenged in many, many ways. Uh, I'm not, no one denies that. But the bottom line is we still consider it a blessing. Does it have to be uh, uh, monitored and watched? Absolutely. But today also, the different medicines that are being coming out in the market that basically are addressing almost every ailment um, are also mind-blowing in their power. But there's another side to it all that notwithstanding the blessing, just like when it comes to anything that is prosperous, we live in more prosperous times than we've ever lived. Yes, we call it a financial meltdown, but compared to our grandparents, this is, this is the biggest meltdown is, 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 is like living like a, a king. You know, the amount of food we have, the indulgence, the waste, the taking for granted our gifts and blessings. Again, I'm not suggesting turning the clock back, but everything is, is relative, relativity theory. As Jigen, the great uh, Jewish comedian, or actually he was a linguist, Jigen a Shuchmacher, you know them? So, anyway, so he said the Jewish relativity theory goes like this, that when you have three hairs, um, th uh, three hairs on, oh, how's, how does he say it? One second. Uh, um, three hairs on your head is not much, but those same three hairs in the soup, that's called the relativity theory, okay? <laughs> he says it in Yiddish, so it has its own particular uh, flavor. So that's really the real relativity theory. Before Einstein was uh, the Jewish relativity theory, where everything is uh, relative in that sense. So, um, so prosperity, with all its blessings, and in Judaism, we, we, wealth is a blessing, health is a blessing, comfort is a blessing, it's not like maybe in some other religions or other thoughts we consider it a blessing. That doesn't mean it doesn't come with a challenge. The same Torah that talks about how God will bless you with prosperity, even material prosperity, not just spiritual. It also says, beware of keichi ve'etzin yadi, which means beware of the, of the challenge when you are successful, that you should not think that I am self-made. That keichi ve'etzin yadi asuli asachai lazeh, that I, with my own power and my own strength have done it all. Remember, it's kechi, it's the blessings of God. That doesn't mean we cannot uh, create containers for those blessings. So prosperity comes with the challenge of becoming arrogant, of uh, becoming uh, self-assured, of becoming condescending, etc., etc. But it's still a blessing. The same thing is with uh, all the medical or scientific breakthroughs of our time. These are all blessings. But they all come with their own challenges. And one of the great challenges, which is not something original in these, I'm saying it in original, originally, I think it's something that is, is, has been mentioned by many, is on the same, on the other hand, with all these medical breakthroughs, the question is, are we really healthier human beings? We may live longer, but is our psychological, emotional health better? With all the toxins that we take in, are we really healthier than those that lived many years ago, that may not have lived as long, even though some say, I mean, I'm not talking about the beginning of the biblical times where life expectancy was a whole different story. But even today, you have in the Caucasian mountains people who live over 100 naturally, and they smoke as well. But they live in a, not, not an industrial environment. They're not eating uh, processed foods. 
They're not breathing toxic air, industrial air. So there's a certain. So what does health mean? What is the definition of health? And the fact is that today, um, there's another story. Basically, with every pharmaceutical breakthrough, with every new therapist, you can also say it's like mar ben nechos and mar is the expression. The more you have, the more you have, the more anxiety you have. In a way, knowing that you could pop a pill for almost anything doesn't necessarily make us healthy. It means we, we know we can compensate. So is medicine today actually fundamentally making health, creating healthier people? Or is it dealing with the symptoms in much better ways than we've ever dealt with? It? You know, they say about the computer age, junk in, junk out. A computer does not create more refined human beings, nor does it create higher spiritual or ethical standards. It just crunches numbers faster. I know I'm not trying to dismiss the whole computer revolution. But the bottom line is, it depends what you put into it. You put junk into it, that will be faster. If you put quality into it, that will be faster. So it's, yes, today you can reach and send an email to someone who, God forbid, let's say, is in pain. And you can reach them in a second instead of sending a letter or traveling with a camel for who knows and never getting a receipt whether your note or letter ever reached that place. So you can reach people very quickly. But you could also reach people quickly with a message of destructive message or with frivol frivolous stuff. So we should not, distinct, we should not um, ever create the delusion just because we, everything is available to us on an iPod and now iPad and iPhone and all the I, other I's that are going to probably be emerging. Interesting, they all begin with I, me. Yeah, that, that, was, that was a spontaneous uh, revelation. Um, uh, and I think it's all great stuff because it's, I think it's a blessing. But with all those things, we should never separate between that and the fundamentals. Remember, the need for a mother, the need for someone, a mother holding a child, the nurturing and love, spiritual nourishment that we get from each other will never be replaced by a computer, no matter what. Books, perhaps, will be replaced. The debate rages on. Yeah, but just like uh, um, um, from Amazon released the Kindle, so everybody was saying, how could you do that? The sacrilegious, the, the holy sacred book. And he made a good point. He said, technology is anything that's uh, invented after you're born. Books were once also technology. You could imagine that when the first books came out, the Gutenberg Press and all of that, there was probably also sacrilegious. They say, how could you the, the defile the holy scrolls and the papyrus and the parchment that we still use from writing Sefer Torahs and mezuzahs and Tefillin? But a book was also once technology. So that I don't know about, how that will change. That's, that's a matter of, a, of technicality. But the fundamentals, will a mother be able to ever nurture a child through a video screen? Will something ever replace human touch? Will a human tear ever be replicated on a computer? Yeah, you may replicate almost. It may be virtual reality. And it's critical to distinguish between the tools of life and life itself. So when we talk about health, long before healthcare reform and long before the modern uh, the, in, uh, medical breakthroughs, there was a month called Eir. It says, Ani Hashem Refech, I, God, your healer. And that statement is not a small little statement. It comes with a Talmudic statement that follows it. It says, I, God, your healer. So the Talmud says, Mikan, from here we know that God gave Rapa Yerapele. God says, heal and heal them the Talmud says from here we have permission divine permission God gave the human race divine his permission that a human being can heal another human being if you think about it it's a fascinating Talmud we need God's permission to heal I mean it doesn't say that about other things so of course a, a God fearing person feels everything they do they need God for you eat you sleep you breathe everything is dependent Here's a specific statement. Let me share with you a story that I heard from a doctor that I once went to. Um, he, uh, the doctor, I'm not going to mention his name. I mean, not that I'm not going to say any Lashon Hara here, but, but uh, it's not relevant to the name. He told me that around 1985, he had an older chassid, an older man came to see him, who had what they call Yena Machla. It was uh, what we call in Jewish, Yena Machla means that disease. You don't even want to mention it. Unmentionable disease. It's cancer. And uh, he, was, uh, he, was, uh, he was a really elderly man. In his, I think, late 70s. I'm mean, not call that elderly. I don't want to say that. It's elderly. Maybe 90s elderly today. 
Well, anyway, he was in his late 70s. And the doctor came, he came in Friday to see the doctor after, after all the treatments. The doctor said to him, Rab Usher, that was his name, you can go home and prepare to meet your maker, basically. I can do nothing, we can do nothing more for you. No point for you to stay in the hospital or stay come anywhere else. Stay, go home and you, have, you don't have much time left. Anyway, uh, this Rab Usher was very disturbed by these words. A doctor just giving him this type of, uh, even though he was, he understood the medical diagnosis, it was bleak, etc., etc. So he wrote a note in to, um, to, uh, to the Lubavitcher Rebbe about this topic, about what, what the doctor told him. That Shabbos, so the Rebbe spoke about, it was the laws of the Rambam, Maimonides, has the thing, there's a, there's a set of laws called Hilchus Trefus. Hilchus Trefus. The laws of uh, what we call non-kosher. But what does the word treif mean when we say kosher treif? Most of us think kosher treif is not kosher, whatever, it's not slaughtered right. Not the word for treif. Treif actually means something in Hebrew. Treif means a terminal illness. If a cow, a behemoth, or any other uh, kosher animal has some type of puncture in the lung, let's say, or some other uh, ailment or some other uh, handicap that is terminal, that can cause the animal to die within a certain period of time, then you call that treif. If it's a puncture or some other ailment, but it can be healed, it doesn't necessarily render the animal treif. The question, of course, is who, discer- who decides? Who decides what's terminal and what's not terminal? So we have a whole series of laws that God put, that, 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 that based on the Bible and based on the Talmudic interpretation of biblical verses that defines what is terminal and what's not terminal. And here's what the, the rabbi the rabbis said. He said like this, that not doctors and not human beings decide what is terminal. A doctor was given, the Talmud says, the Khan Nitin Rishuz, the doctor was given permission to heal. Nowhere does it say a doctor was given permission to kill or to determine when a person will die. God was very precise. I'm giving you permission to heal, even though healing comes from God. I don't know if you know this, but there's an interesting message that before Jacob, there was no such, there was no such thing as illness. People just died. Or, or, or old age, the measure says. But God is saying that even though a person gets ill, you could think it can do nothing, maybe we shouldn't intervene. I mean, I think Seventh Day of Adventists, Adventists don't intervene. Jehovah's Witnesses, what they call them. They don't, they have their, their religion doesn't allow them to, uh, I think, go look for medical intervention. Am I right about that? Christian scientists as well. Are there any other religions like that? Anyway, but... Uh, the Talmud says and the, that it's not that case. With we, we, God says, I'm giving you the power to heal. Which is itself a discussion, just to, as a little footnote I'll add, when the, the Roman philosopher came to Rabbi Akiva and asked him, he was being cynical. He said, if God wanted your boys to be circumcised, bris, he should have created them circumcised. Why are you going and tampering with God's creation? So Rabbi Akiva, in the wise way, answered, always a Jew with a question with a question, well, if God wanted us to have bread, He should have given us bread. Why does He give us, uh, cause us to first figure out there's a thing called seeds, and you, grain seeds, and you plant them in the ground, and, they, and it's a whole process till they grow, and grow in a healthy way. Then you have to cut them and thresh them and turn them into flour. And you mix the flour with water, and then you bake it and you have bread. I mean, like the 30 steps. God wanted us to have bread, He should have just given us bread. Which basically Rabbi Akiva is saying, we are shutaf la kodesh baruchu b'maisabreshis. We're partners with God in creation. God is essentially the investor, gives us the resources, and it's up to us to develop those resources. And resources don't, doesn't just mean resources like grain. It also means the, t- the tools and potential that we are blessed with. Each of us has potential. One man once said to his rabbi, he said, the rabbi was telling him, you have such great uh, skills and talents. Why don't you use them? You'll be alamdan. He says, you know, my, he says, my, he said to his Rebbe, you know, Rebbe, you know that I could always do it. So basically, I'm a potential lam. So the Rebbe, the, his rabbi said to him, listen, just like a ganif, a thief, is not someone who's a, who can steal, someone who steals, a lam is not someone who could learn, but someone who learns. Yeah, we all have potential for things. Potential doesn't define a person. We have potential to do good things, we have potential to do bad things. That doesn't define you. The, the, what defines you is the ratio between your potential and your actualization. So Rabbi Akiva was actually sharing with him a, the, 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 a, 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 a simple but profound concept in life 
that we're partners with God. God gives us uh, life, gives us blessings, skills, tools, faculties. Our role is to develop them, to actualize them. So going back to the, the theme of, uh, to, the, to the concept that I was discussing before about, um, about healing, the same is true when God said, look, I'm giving you my divine power to heal. Even though you're human beings, how could one mortal heal another mortal? You'd think healing is also only in the domain of the divine. I remember once it was a weekend retreat, Shabbaton. It was very, uh, a very uh, moving moment that I'll never forget. So we did it like a, it was like a, it was a camping retreat, which has its own particular challenges. Don't ask me how I got to do camping, but it's a long story. But I, I ended up uh, sleeping under the stars. You know, you know that that what do they say there about? Uh, uh, was it um, Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson? So they once went camping, and uh, and they went to they pitched their tent. They went to sleep. Okay, In the middle of the night they both wake up. And they're looking at each other, and 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 Holmes says to Watson, "So what do you see?" So he looks up. He says, "I see the stars." So what does that tell you? He says, oh, "The celestial bodies tells me there's so much." how infinite the universe is. Uh, from a meteorological point of view, tomorrow will probably be a beautiful day. From a religious point of view, it's a reflection of the divine. And he's waxing eloquent. And then he says to Holmes, to Sherlock Holmes, and what do you see? He says, I see that someone stole my tent. <laughs> someone stole our tent. So he was, uh, you have to be practical too sometimes. Anyway, um, so we did this camping retreat, and it was Shabbos Nachmu, that I remember. And there was one woman who was at the retreat, and uh, you know, we had, uh, our staff was all instructed to remember, especially one of these camping retreats, there's always something can go wrong. Make sure everybody's taken care of, anybody needs anything extra, help them, etc. And if anyone is really uh, uncomfortable, send them to me, I told them. Anyway, so this woman, obviously no one could handle, so she came to me and she was like, just unbelievably angry. You know, I tried to come and I said, listen, we're here already, let's make the best of it. Her p tent wasn't pitched properly. Uh, she was thought it may rain. She was right. Uh, I should add. <laughs> and uh, anyway, it was very, very disturbed. She was very disturbed. I tried to calm down. Nothing, nothing worked. Anyway, the next day, and, and you know, I felt, felt uncomfortable because the whole time I felt that, like, you know, I, I, what do you do? She's with you here. We have to make the best of it. But she was really creating a very sour mood. I mean, she wasn't, most people didn't notice it, but I did. So the next morning when we read the Torah, we're reading Nachamu, and so before the reading, I shared a few words, and I said that uh, the the the, um, the Medrash brings Avudraham is one of the classic halacha commentaries. He explains the seven what's called the Shiva de Nechemta, the seven weeks after Tisha B'av, we read a special of Torah each week. In a progressive form, he explains the consolation of the prophets to the Jewish people after the destruction of the temple. So each week progresses. The first week is Shabbos Nachamu, that after the destruction, Nachamu, Nachamu, Jeremiah, Yermio, consoles the people, Nachamu, Nachamu, Ami. May you be consoled, my nation, may you be consoled, may you be consoled. And then each week there's another level of consolation. So the Medrash brought in the Avudraham, explains that after the prophet consoles the Jews, the Jews come back and say, we're not consoled. Why are you coming to console us? God destroyed our temple, let him come and console us. So on the third week we say, Anoichi, Anoichi, Humen Achemchem, God finally responds that I will console you. So the obvious question which I asked was, what God didn't understand, if you hurt somebody, you should console them. Well, don't send a messenger. Don't send a, 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 God destroyed the temple. He wants to tell the Jews, I'm sorry, or he wants to tell them they'll have the strength to endure. So you come and share it with us. Why did God have to wait till the Jews complained? And then he came at the end, he did come. It says God himself came to console. So what I explained was based on the same idea we're talking, discussing here tonight about healing, that God wanted to give human beings a gift. Of course that God can console us, that's a given. But that humans can console us. You'd think if two people are in pain... We're both mortals. How could one person in pain console another person in pain? So, ein chavush. What was that? Sound like a foghorn. 
<laughs> um, so you think in Chavish Matir Satsme, the Talmud says in Brachas, which means a person in fetters cannot free themselves. One mortal can't console another mortal. You need God. God says, no, I'm giving you the gift. I'm giving you the power that you can go to someone who's in pain and say something kind to them. You have my power to, to console them. That's why God sent the prophet. It wasn't he was trying to get out of it. It was a reason. And then when the Jews asked for more, God gave in and also said, I will also console you. When we go, we have the power to go visit the sick, God forbid. It's called the mitzvah of Vikr Cholim, to visit the sick. And you could think, well, what, 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 why, well God should uh, be Mavak Cholim. Actually, matter of fact, where do we learn the mitzvah of visiting the sick? We learn it from God. God went to visit Abraham after he circumcised himself. That's where we learn the mitzvah. So you'd think, okay, that God visits the sick, that makes sense. What can we really do? We ourselves are mortals. We ourselves are able to be unhealthy, God forbid. But God bestowed upon us a part of himself, in a way, the power to heal another. The Talmud even says, when you visit someone that's not well, you take away one sixtieth of the illness. So me, the smart aleck, when I was a kid, I once went with my father, we went to visit someone in the hospital. And I heard about the one sixtieth thing. So I asked my father, does that mean if you visit someone 60 times, they, they heal? So he said, not exactly. He said, what does that mean? So he says, you'll get older, you'll understand. So I'm older now, and uh, I tell the same thing to my children. I don't fully understand, but, uh, well, in a way you do. Obviously, 160 doesn't mean quantity. It's a, it's, a, it's a spirit thing. What I mean by spirit is when you actually visit someone, you do give them confidence and strength. God forbid you see someone in a hospital doesn't have relatives or friends or, or hope. It definitely weakens the immune system. It weakens the will, the resolve to fight. So there's no question that we have the power to help each other. And the fact is that one of the best things when a person is anxious or depressed is to have a good friend to talk to. So going back to healing, God gave us this gift. But he only gave the gift one way. He didn't say that I'm giving you the gift to heal. I'm also giving you the gift to kill or to or not heal. After that Shabbos, I'm going back to the story. This doctor tells me he got a call from the secretary of the Rebbe. And the secretary said, the Rebbe told me to share with you what he said this Shabbos. Because it was all in response to this Rebbe Usher, who the doctor sent home, telling him he should greet his maker. The Rebbe prepared to greet his maker. Which meant, and the doctor told me these words, I'll never forget, he says, it changed my whole medical practice, my whole attitude. I was arrogant. You know, I thought I'm a doctor, I could heal people, I have power. And I forgot that it's not my power. He says, and I realized it's a gift that God gives people the power to heal. I mean, I don't know how many doctors have that uh, called bedside manner or uh, humility. Some do. I've met some doctors that are unbelievably humble in this sense and great doctors. And they'll always tell you there's a mystery to healing. We know much, but there's a lot more that we don't know. And that's something that actually is, 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 shouldn't, uh, shouldn't cause us to have less confidence in doctors. I would trust a doctor that said that much more than one says that he knows everything. Because there are mysteries. I know a woman recently that got pregnant after 10 years uh, and everything the doctors said, no way you could ever get pregnant. All the tests showed, and yet she and yet got pregnant. There was one doctor, his name is Dr. Griffo. I don't know if you've ever heard of him. He's here in NYU. Uh, yeah, NYU. He's the head of uh, the fertility unit. Uh, he, he had that humility. He said to her, look, I'm, I will tell you that, remember, when it comes to fertility especially, it's a mystery. There are things we know and we try but I've seen women who absolutely could not give birth, and they have. Some we didn't think they could conceive. Some we didn't think they can carry the child. And then there was the opposite as well. Everything seemed to check out. Everything is right, and, and it doesn't work. There's a gift. There's a, you know, he happens to be a person of faith, so he calls it God. You know, uh, the point being is there's a humility that was necessary. That doesn't make him less of a doctor. It's a, like I said before, God gives us great gift. When it says Moses was the humblest man that walked on this earth, so the question is asked, what do you mean, why was he so humble? He, he had great gifts? Moses? I mean, how many people were like Moses? No person ever saw God face to face, the Torah, the Talmud, the Torah says, as Moses, like speaking to a friend. So the answer given is in Hebrew, the word anav is not the same as the word shuffle. Anav means humble. Shuffle means low self-esteem. A humble person is not a person of low self-esteem. A humble person says... I have many tools, many, many great strengths, but I never forget they're not my own. Moses said to himself, the strengths I have were given to me by God. And had he given them to someone else, 
they may have done much better than I did. That doesn't make, that's humility. It's not delusional. It's not thinking, oh, my strengths are not strengths. A person of low self-esteem actually in a way is defying God. He's saying, I have no strengths at all. Essentially telling God, listen, you brought, created me, but you created me with, uh, without any strengths. Which is uh, itself a certain form of arrogance. But humility, on the other hand, is absolute self-awareness. But you never forget that you're a channel. Why is this so relevant? Because healing ultimately is not about medication and it's not about treatment. It's about an awareness that there's a flow of life that comes from the soul, the soul, the neshama. And even in the, in, in, the, in the original Greek terms of healing, the sound body, a sound soul inside of a sound body, if you think about it, what really is health? Health is the soul flowing through the body without any impediments. That's really what it comes down to. Now that may sound simple, but it's not so simple. It's a seamlessness. It's a seamlessness of two forces at work, one spirit, the other matter, and there's no impediments. It's so seamless that you can't even tell that there, want, that there are two forces at work here. God forbid, after death, what's the difference between a, a corpse and a, health, and a human body, and a, life, a live body? I'm not talking about if there's illness or anything. You can't tell the difference on the body. The difference is one has life force in it, one doesn't have a life force in it. So the idea really of health, now you say, for example, um, uh, neshama. You say the word for soul is neshama. But the word for soul, is, the word for neshama can also be pronounced neshima, breath. The Medrash says, I'll call neshama tahalal ka. Every soul praises God, the end of the book of Psalms. It says neshama, neshima, every breath you take you should praise God. And that's not just a, 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 a euphemism, it comes from a verse. In the Bible it says, God blew into the nostrils of this piece of clay, earth, Adam, and, and created life. So life is the breath of God. Which is therefore not coincidental that you find in yoga or other uh, exercises, you find very much breath and life being connected. Breath is the breath of life. In, in, in Kabbalistic terminology based on a verse in Yecheskel, Exhaling and inhaling is a form of energy. It reflects the energy of the heartbeat contracting and expanding. It's a flow of energy. So the flow of life is what is all about, is what real health is about. So if someone is able to medic through, through pills or medicines or other interventions, is able to create a healthy, physical, healthy body, that doesn't mean a person is healthy. That means that maybe the machine is functioning well. You know, you can oil a machine and it's functioning, but it doesn't mean it has life inside of it. It's like they say the difference between a uh, beautiful home and a house. You can have a mansion that has every, every gadget and every piece of beauty in it, but it's empty of the void of life. And you can have a home that is, that is very sparse and very uh, meager, but you see life in it. You see children running around, you feel love. It's not something that's tangible. Which is the healthier home? So if you think of health in terms of efficiency or health in terms of functionality, maybe the one that has more, uh, more wealth is more health. But if you think in terms of uh, love, warmth, the forces of nurturing that give, that give us life, it's obviously the second one. Obviously, they're not a contradiction. It would be great to have both, the best of both worlds. But I'm just stating it from context of, of contrast. To put things in context, rather, and contrast. So we say, Ani Hashem Rafecha for this month, we're saying like this, you have the abilities, every one of us, the faculties to grow, to develop, to actualize yourself. But never forget that it's a force that comes from a greater place. Health really is the divine spirit that flows through us. You could have, um, let's put it this way, you could be physically the healthiest person, fit, you could have all the wealth in the world, you could have success, uh, be respected but if you don't have that inner dignity of feeling that you have a purpose in this life you can be a person walking around like a zombie in this material world it's very easy to delude ourselves that something is successful because it looks good you, know, you see somebody sometimes you think they're put together everything seems to be working well start speaking to them you find out that life is, is falling apart 
Because we live in a world of dichotomy. We live in a world of, you could say, duplicity. What you see is not what you get. We were accustomed to that because uh, the, the words of the, the way the Talmud puts it, echad v'peh, echad v'lev. It's easy to be to say one thing and feel another. You can be friendly to someone and stab them in the back. Sometimes someone smiles to you and they can be your biggest enemy. For children, such an existence, such a diet, such a duplicity is unfathomable. That's why children, we call them naive, but in a way children are closer to the truth. Everything, what you see is what you get. A child sees someone showing love. Until they learn otherwise, they expect love. Until they're told, there's deception. Not everything that you see is, is, is what you get. You can get a sweet candy. It can be poisonous inside of etc., etc. So we live in a world that all the great Jewish sages always were, cons- were always bothered by this type of world. How could there be a world? Talk about Olam HaEmes, in the world of truth, everything is true. They call this world Alma de Shikra. It was a great chassid, which means a world of lies. It was a great chassid the last day of his life. And he was ready on his deathbed. And they asked him, what do you look forward to? He said, I look forward to not lying any longer in my life. Lying. As in lies, deception. And this was a great chassid. What does he mean? He was lying? No, life has a certain element of deception to it. Even if you're not a deceptive person, it's just a, there's a certain uh, duplicity, there's a certain where well, you have to protect yourself perhaps because other people are, um, are deceptive. I mean, there's many, many reasons. And we do get jaded through life. Who of us, as we grew up, perhaps much more, more idealistic, and then when you get burned once, twice, three times and disappointed, you begin to get hardened. And then you don't want to take, be taken advantage of. And I'm not saying for bad reason. It could be that we were actually hurt. To maintain an integrity, almost like the innocence of a child, and have the seasoning of an adult, a real experienced adult, is not a common thing. Because it really is almost like contradictions. Because we do live in a tough world. So in a tough world, sharks, you become like a shark. And uh, again, I'm not criticizing. It's sometimes the way people see themselves surviving. Well, that's why we have a Torah and we have a Judaism that tries to keep us a little honest which tries to teach us that, yes, we come from Passover, it's a celebration of freedom, but don't ever get too arrogant with your freedom and your gifts. Start counting. Remember that there's refinement to take place. You have to refine yourself. You have to heal. Healing is not just for the sick. Healing is also for the healthy. Healing means, as they say about tshuva, so some people think tshuva, who does tshuva? Repentance. Most of us, tshuva is for a sinner. A sinner needs to do tshuva. So you could argue we all do, we all sin, so we all need to do some tshuva. They used to make, uh, they used to, this was a joke they used to say, that there were certain synagogues that they thought the people were perfect there. So in their siddur, in their machzer, it said in Yom Kippur, before you say al chet, kan sarech lases avera kala. Here is a place where you should do a small little sin. In other words, since you're such a perfect human being, if you don't do a sin, you won't have anything to say uh, penitence on. That was supposed to be a joke, by the way. Um, okay, my delivery was off. But the point is that um, the truth is, however, tshuva, the word for tshuva in Hebrew does not just mean re- repentance. Actually, tshuva comes from the word return. Shuva Hashem, tshuva, to return. Repent implies leaving something. I'm repenting, I did this, I regret it, and I leave my, bad, my past bad ways, so to speak. Shuva means to return. What are you returning to if you're leaving your uh, evil ways? The answer is you return to your soul. Because you see, Jews don't believe in original sin. We believe that there is sin. We believe that something can obscure our connection to the divine. But we don't, we don't believe that we are ever severed completely. And op- only through faith in a certain Jew do you get um, saved. Who that Jew is is another discussion. But... For, we do not believe in such intermediaries and we also do not believe in a sin that is more powerful than God. The soul remains intact. Afal Pisha Chati Yisrael who every morning we say in the prayer our soul is pure. That doesn't mean a pure soul can't enter into impure world and impure activity but it still remains, retains a certain uh, purity in its es- essential nature. And as such we all need tshuva. Even a tzaddik. The Zohar says, La Sovet Sadekai Betiyufta, when Mashiach comes, even Sadikim will do tshuva. You could say, What are they doing tshuva for? What are they repenting over? They, were, they behaved in ways that were noble, giving, no sin. Because all of us can get closer to God. There's no such thing as saying, You're already there. Um, 
it's a yochel mechayel ochayel process, which means we go from strength to strength. And it says in the Talmud that tzaddikim ain lahem anucha. The righteous don't have peace, not in this world, not in the world to come, because it's a constant journey. Anyone in search of perfection thinks they're going to come to an end. The result doesn't work that way. Perfection is the domain of God. And that's an infinite journey that is endless. And that shouldn't perturb us. That's part of the, glory, the glorious journey that it is. And as such, we all can always heal and always get greater. So here's an interesting Talmud. It says about Moses. Moses, it says that God created 50 gates. Nun shari bina, chamishim shari bina, 50 gates of understanding. And he gave the human race 49 of them. And the 50th remains elusive. So the Maggid of Mizrich says that when Moses climbed the mountain, we know the mountain Nevoi. In the Bible it says, what mountain did Moses climb when he end, when it came to the end of his life? Mount Nevoi, in Hebrew Nevoi is the letters Nun, Beis, Vav. Nun, Boi. So the Maggid and other books say the same thing, that this is the mountain, when Moses climbed that mountain for the last time, he finally was able to reach the 50th gate. But only at the end of his life. So 49 days we count. The 50th day we don't, the 50th day we don't count. Shavuos we don't count. But you reach it when you count the 49. Now here's the interesting statement that states like this. A very weird but also very powerful. It says the word chayla, which means uh, the word for a sick person. In Hebrew is a chayla. A person that's ill is called a chayla. Chayla is a gematria. That's the numerical equivalent. Hebrew letters have numer numbers to them. So Chola is the gematria of 49. Ches is 8. Vav is 6 is 14. 30, Lamed. So we have 44. And Hey, 40, uh, what did I say? 49, right? Ches, 8, 16, 30. Oh, 46, I'm sorry. And um, I'm getting all confused. Chayla, 8, 6 is 14. 34. And 5, yeah, and uh, hey, is 9, 49. You got it right. I knew it's 49. I'm just figuring out how we got to that. Um, and it says, the expression in the, in the book, I think in Sh Song of Songs, it says, Chaylas Ava. I'm sick with love. Okay. Some popular songs were composed based on that verse. Okay. Sick with love. What does that mean? Love sick. So often we think of it in terms of a negative thing. That you love someone so much that you get sick over it. That has a sh certain significance, but it refers to it says Moses, who gained the 49 gates, and yet he was sick because he could not gain the 50th one. And that made him ill. Now the question is asked, that type of illness we would all like to have, you know. That should be our worst illness. Now, the only thing you're missing is the 50th gate of understanding. To gain 49 gates is a pretty big achievement. And we use the same word for, God forbid, a really sick person. So we see, as I said earlier, that everything is relative. The fact is, for a person who's reached the greatest heights and has still something to reach, there's a certain illness in his heart. You know, I don't know, maybe illness is too strong of a word, but it's called a certain, something is missing. And for that missing component, for that relative to Moses' level, he was missing the 50th. The thing is, we don't never will count 50 days. Shavuos is matan Torah. The word matan Torah comes from the word a gift. Matan means a matana, a gift. But the gift you can only receive after you count the 49, which is, again, going back to that concept of being a partner with the divine. There are gifts in life that you'll never get directly, but you get them indirectly. You know, sometimes we rush things and we'd like to be, we're impatient, we want something. Sometimes you have to earn your way. And when you earn your way, and you say, so did I really earn it or I didn't earn it? The answer is, through your hard work, you came to a point where then something will be given to you. So without the hard work, you never can get 50 without 49. But the 50th is ultimately coming from a place that's beyond you. So never think that that last step is yours. On the other hand, you would never have it without what you did. Which is, again, all blessings in life work that way. It's like coming to certain revelations or epiphanies in life. The epiphany itself comes from a higher place, but you'd never be able to appreciate it or earn it did you not do, if you had not done your work. You not done your, if you not earned your way, if you not paid your dues, as, so to speak. So this is all part of this healing process. So we talk about healing. The question that really has to be asked 
is healing is not something on the outside. It's not how fit your body is. I, sh I should rephrase that. It's also how fit your body is. But it's more important how fit is your soul and how fit is your body to contain your soul's energy, the divine breath that flows through you. And that type of health has a lot more to do with character, personality, how you love, how you, the discipline of your life, the compassion, empathy of your life, the endurance and ambition, your humility, your bonding, and your dignity. So the seven emotional faculties that we, that we work with and we look at and we inspect and examine during this period is a real healing process. So the Jews leave Egypt, or we all recreate that redemption, that exodus, essentially a transcendent experience. But transcendence is a temporary thing until you do something about it. So it's fascinating. As great as a liberation, as great as a revelation Exodus was, then comes step two. Fifty days later will be a greater revelation, the Mount Sinai. But that doesn't come without effort. You think after 210 years, the Jews suffered in the worst possible way. It was a holocaust of the time. Murder, uh, hard labor. I'm not even talking about the discrimination. It was a really serious... Uh, Serious genocide, a serious um, uh, exile was Golis Mitzrayim. And in some places it says it was worse than any hardship that Jews would ever endure because remember there was also nowhere to go. Egypt was the superpower. You could, there was nowhere to run. There's no such thing as uh, just saying, oh, you know what, uh, we'll be deported or go somewhere else. So you think after so much suffering, God should have some compassion and say, okay, you know, let them rest, let them uh, relax. No, immediately, second day of Passover, second night, we start counting the Omer. It almost it strikes you a little like almost, um, like, you know, leave them alone, let them, give them a day off or something. It, it, it strikes me also when you think about it, the tar, you know, I think I discussed it before Pesach, before Passover, when it says why, one of the reasons we eat matzah was because the Jews didn't have time to wait for the matzah to rise, the, 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 the matzah to rise, because they were rushing out of Egypt. So if you think about it, it's a little odd. 210 years, God kept them in exile. Suddenly, there's no time to wait. wait you know, what, what they could say, another two minutes, three minutes, let's have, let's have some geschmack, you know, some tasty bread. <laughs> Suddenly, no, we're out of here. Obviously, there's more to it than just, you know, there's, uh, than, than just suddenly rushing. There's something about it to be said that, there's, that especially in Judaism, even in our greatest moments and greatest freedoms, we never take it for granted. And immediately you have to remember that the work begins. So it's not like there's a day off or something like that. You begin immediately the process of refining yourself. Even while we are at that height of, uh, of transcendence that Passover represents. It reminds me of like under a chuppah, Jewish wedding ceremony. So the so custom is that at the end of the chuppah they break a glass. The groom steps on a glass glass is broken. And there are different reasons given for it. The symbolism of breaking, of wholeness, marriage. There's, uh, one of the reasons is it's called Zecher Lechorb, which means to remember the destruction. Um, so breaking the glass is like a symbol of the destruction of the temple. The question, the obvious question is, you know, there are a lot of times we remember destruction. Tishabov, every Tishabov, we sit Shiva. We sit on low stools, we darken the lights, dim the lights. Why of all times, the height of a poor people's life, they're about to, they're getting married, they just got married. I mean, there's no greater joy. What happens later is another story in some marriages. But at least at that moment, let them be. Why do you have to remind them that there's destruction? Why do you have to remind the whole uh, crowd, the whole, uh, the whole um, all those gathered? So there's a, a very powerful answer, a very simple one as well. It's about humility. It goes like this. It's even psychological. You'll see people who celebrate in absolute celebration that they forget about those that are less needy or those that are not celebrated. You'll see people who are absolute and extreme in their celebration. God forbid, when they're not celebrating, they're also extreme. So for Jews, it was always, was, everything was with a so-called, I don't call it grain of salt. It was like saying that even at the height of your joy, Always remember there are some people who are not so joyous in this world. There's still some broken hearts. There's still some things in this world that are not complete. 
We're not just remembering the temple. We're remembering that the world is not perfect. There's much to be done. When you reserve a little space in your moment of joy, a great moment of joy, for, the, for that type of compassion, then God forbid when, when, when things are not so good in your life, it also won't be extreme. There will be a little opening for some joy. It's an attitude. It's an approach that we don't just completely indulge in our experience. We remember. We think we are humbled. Katenti mekolach sodim is the way Jacob said it. I'm humbled by all the chesed God, that God you did for me. You think, why is that a moment of humility? You should celebrate. You should be proud, happy. Because it's like a measure of remembering that as much as we're getting, there's always a room for becoming too, too, um, too arrogant with the, with the blessings we get. So this period of, of healing is really about a humble journey of recognizing that health really is about the humility of the soul. Uh, yes, we live in a tough world and you've got to be tough at times to defend yourself and those you love, defend your values, I'm not suggesting that we don't have enemies, so to speak, we should lock our doors, especially talking about the Jewish people. Thank God we're blessed today that we don't have uh, um, what's called institutionalized anti-Semitism. We can sit here in a shul and talk Torah and not afraid that someone's going to arrest us. This was not a given just a few years ago in places like the former Soviet Union or go back to Europe. I mean, we don't have to turn very far. My father was grew up in Stalinist Russia. Most of you, I mean, I grew up, I was born in freedom, so I take it for granted. I'm one of these spoiled American uh, brats, as my grandfather, when he was in a special mood, would tell me. Um, or maybe when I was behaving in a particular fashion. Um, and, but many of us, it's our parents or our grandparents, I don't have to look far back, it's not great, 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 that uh, did not live in such freedom. It's very easy to forget, very easy to take for granted. So healing today is, in a strange way, much more difficult. Then, like the enemies were defined. And in a strange way, when you have enemies outside of you, in a way, homes, families were more intact because they knew what they had to fight for. They knew what the enemies and they knew that if we don't give it to our children, they're not going to get it out there. Today, in a way, because we're free, you know, you know I think about it, like in, if there was, God forbid, a decree, I say God forbid many times over, that no Jew can send their children to Jewish schools, I guarantee everyone would insist on sending them. Because nobody wants to be told what not to do. That was once the case. Once the case was to have a, to teach your child so Jewish education took a, a serious nefesh. It didn't come easy. It was a big thing. In many, many countries, to go back two, three hundred years from now. I mean, there was no, no Jewish community that was, uh, not, that, that, that was not under the threat of expulsion, of, of pogroms, or so on and so forth. So, in a, in a weird way, spiritual health today is much more elusive because we have the comforts. It's easy to, to live. You can buy anything you want. You can eat anything you want. Uh, we are prosperous. But health, as the Ami Hashem Rafecha emphasizes, is internal work. The way we treat each other. Uh, the refinement of human beings and their behavior with each other is much more uh, challenging, especially in times like ours. Because of, in a way, our busy our careers, we're all the rat race, so to speak, the rush hours of our lives. So, Jews don't forget that as Passover ends with all its gifts, we begin a slow, quiet process. Every night you count, every night you look at another part of yourself, and you think of ways of how you can be a more compassionate and giving human being. And yes, amidst all the so called enemies around us, so called challenges that we all have. It's a challenge. It is a challenge to remain, to remain sensitive in an insensitive world. It's very easy to give in and just become like everyone else. We all have that challenge because it's easier. It's just more, you know, you could say, hey, everybody's that way. But the Jewish people, as uh, coming from a house of uh, journalists, my father was a journalist, uh, always uh, reminds me the line that we say is that there are people who make things happen, there are people who watch things happen, and there are people that ask what happened. Now, Abraham made things happen. He didn't say, I live in a house of Terach and a house of idolatry and a world of paganism and I'm just going along. He was a revolutionary. He was a pioneer. Okay, so Echad Hayavram, there was only one Abraham. But he taught it to his children and his children taught it to their children. And then there was a Moses. And then we had these greats. We had a Mordechai. I mean, we have throughout history. We have them all in our genes. That's the thing. 
So it's not about us being Abraham. Remember, we're midgets that stand on the shoulders of giants. And it's more than that. We're not just standing on their shoulders. We have them within our blood. And Jews do not look at a generation in a vacuum. You and I sitting here in this room and all of us come with generations of generations, accumulative strengths. So maybe one little mitzvah or one good deed we have to do, but it doesn't come alone. It comes with thousands of years of struggles and thousands of years of pain and prices that were paid. And then what we're asked to do is that little extra that pushes it over perhaps. That's an enormous uh, uh, empowering thing to know that you're not, you're not alone. That you come with, uh, you stand on, on shoulders of great people. But the, on, on the other hand, it's also an awesome responsibility because those great people are not here in the physical sense of the world. We are. And they watch us. Will we like carry the baton? And it's a marathon. History is. Each of us carries the baton for a little space. Maybe our little leg of the journey is smaller than others in previous generations, but it's still a leg. Without it, you don't get to the destination. I have no doubt that when we say, when we said in the Haggadah on Passover night, we say, Vihi Sha'amdalanu, which means that she, specifically in the feminine, Vihi Sha'amdalanu, she withstood, or she, uh, how would you say Sha'amdalanu? Um, helped us face all the challenges, and it continues saying all those that try to annihilate, and in every generation there's another version of it. What's the generation, what is our generation's annihilation? We don't have Nazis to contend with, we don't have Stalinists to contend with, we don't have the pogroms and the Inquisition and the Crusades, Crusaders to contend with. So what's Bechol Dar What is it in our time? So I'm sure different interpretations can be given. I'll tell you what I think. One of the things our enemies are apathy. Apathy. Like the guy asked his friend, what's worse, apathy or ignorance? And he said, I don't know, and I don't care. You know? Um, apathy is, is its own type of enemy. It comes usually with comforts. And when you have apathy, you stop fighting. We have a war as well. The war to fight today is not a war in the physical sense. It's a spiritual type of war. It's a psychological one. It's not to give in to the standards, common standards. Everyone's doing it. We're all doing it. It's to stand up and say, no, I have a higher standard. And whatever it is I'm doing, it doesn't mean always also reciprocating. Someone gets angry at you. The natural thing is you get angry in return. And it may even be justified. But there's a thing we learn from Joseph when his brothers sold him into slavery. You could think uh, that was a pretty big crime. It wasn't a small matter. So when Joseph meets his brothers and they're embarrassed with what they did, so Joseph says to them, and this is considered like one of the greatest acts of noble acts in history, Joseph says to them, do not think you did this to me. It's God that brought me here in order to bring life to us all. Because remember, had Joseph not ended up in Egypt, the advice of hoarding or uh, stockpiling the grain would never have come. The famine would have struck there too, and who knows what would have happened. It was Joseph's suggestion and Joseph's leadership that allowed Egypt to become a source of sustenance for everyone, including Jacob and his family. And you'd think that Joseph should rise to such an occasion. He had very good reason to be angry. And, 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 and no one would have had, and just judged him. But it says in some of the Machazal, our sages tell us, that because Joseph's act of over, Maivar al that he overlooked his natural reaction, was a sign of divine health. That's a healthy person. He had the courage not to reciprocate. When he had, even according to halacha, according to Jewish law, he had the right to be angry and the right even to uh, perhaps take vengeance, you can say. Because later, for example, I don't know if you're aware of this, but on Yom Kippur when we read about Ela Esker, about the ten martyrs. So if you read the beginning of the story, what's the story? So the emperor, the Roman emperor comes and says, because you killed, you, you sold your brother into slavery, what is the, the, the law and the Torah when you brought, sell someone into slavery? Death. Therefore the emperor says, I want to put the death Ten of your great, the ten greatest leaders of the time, including Rabbi Akiva and others, because to represent the ten brothers that uh, that killed, that uh, sold Joseph into slavery. Now we all know the emperor was not exactly interested in justice. We all know he didn't love Jews, so he found himself an excuse. His excuse was this law. Yet, what did these tzaddikim do? They could have said, "Hey, who was this emperor is preaching to us morality?" 
they went up to heaven, one of them, Rabbi Shmuel, the high, the high priest, and uh, to ask, is it true? Is this a decree from heaven or is it a decree from the emperor? And he hears from the mysterious man that the way the, 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 the prayer says it, Ish Levush Abadim, this mysterious man dressed in white and linen, tells him, Kablu Aleichem, that yes, I heard from behind the curtain, like in secret, that there's a gzair, there's a decree. Basically meaning that God agreed that it's true that they deserve the death penalty. Again, this doesn't mean the emperor was, that was his intention. It's another passion, another story. And you see, therefore, that the, the selling of Joseph was not such a small act. And yet Joseph overlooked it. Because he overlooked it, the, the sages say, there are many blessings his tribe, his children were given, and many blessings we ourselves have today because of Joseph's act. Was it expected? No, it was Lefani Meshur Sadin, it's called, beyond the letter of the law. But that's what a divine human being does. That's what a healthy human being does. A healthy human being is not always seen a person who knows how to uh, defend himself. Sometimes a healthy human being is a person who knows how to rise to a greater place. And it's a transcendent type of thing. And that's what the Jewish people have always been symbols of at their best. We all know that times we're not always at our best. But when we are at our best, we have the ability to do things that are even beyond what's normally or humanly uh, expected. So I would say is like this, in, a, in this period of time, you know, they say inner health brings outer health. In the Torah, V'neshmartem al nafshe seichem is a mitzvah. It's a mitzvah to be a healthy human being. God commands us, be healthy. But as the Rambam, Maimonides says, to be an, a, a guv bari, a healthy body, is part of serving God. Because if you don't have a healthy body, the illnesses and the anxieties can disturb your way of serving. How could a person pray, study, do a mitzvah when they have to run to doctors, God forbid, or they have pain and they can't concentrate on anything but getting rid of their own uh, discomfort? So part of the bless part of the blessing of when we say someone should be healthy is not just spiritual health, physical health, but the fact is that you can have a very healthy body but be a very anxious human being as well. So I want to say, uh, I guess. Say a birches hedyet, a simple blessing to us all. In this month of year, God should bless us all with both levels of health, outer and inner. The thing that we can work on most, obviously, and that may be most in our control, is really both areas, but the focus primarily is to remember that healing and health is more than just the absence of illness. It's allowing yourself to recognize that there is a deeper flow of life that you can draw into your life when you're connected. It says, It means when you are dveikus, what's the word for dveikus? You will cleave, you connect to the source of life, it brings you life. Life comes from somewhere, life comes from our souls. So it's true, the container has to be uh, um, con uh, intact for the life flow to come in. But at the same time, you also need the life flow. So I would say that health in a way is coming from two directions. To repair the containers, make sure they're as healthy as possible. Because obviously, if the container, the body in some way is locked or something else is uh, disturbing, the flow cannot enter. But there's also opening up channels of the flow. And we can, in that sense, constantly become healthier and healthier. Every one of the 49 days of the Omer is a step toward a healthier, sound human being. To the point that we come to Matan Torah, we reach the 50th gate which is given to us. And it says by Matan Torah, by Sinai, everybody was healed. That's not just a, an accident. That's because when you do the healing from the, from the bottom up, the healing also flows from the top down. So may we all be such channels and uh, bring much love to each other, compassion, all the other seven emotions which uh, is uh, the work that we do from Chesed of Chesed all the way to Malchus of Malchus on the last day of the counting of the Omer. And uh, please see me and uh, our I mean, for Life Center and everything we do as allies. In any way we could help you. And any way, uh, hope it uh, goes both ways, we help each other. Above all, trying to be kindred spirits to uh, not just maneuver, but to maybe show some direction. And each of us has our sphere of influence where you can share a nice, kind word, where you can uh, sometimes say something. you never be surprised what a nice uh, gesture can do, especially in someone's tough day. 
and it can open up uh, opportunities, open up channels that you never know where our blessings come from. So I want to say again uh, that it may be a very healthy month, the month of year, as the name implies, on all levels, and everyone should find blessings in any possible way. And I announce again, tomorrow night, uh, Philip gives his class uh, um, here at 7 o'clock. I'll be here next Wednesday. And I announced about the seminar, which will be online, um, as well as perhaps here, I'm not sure yet, we're going to see scheduling, but we'll let you know by email or the ways we get the word out. And uh, again, the class was dedicated by Mark Polinsky, in honor of um, father's birthday, I think. That's grandfather's yeah. Right, grandfather's, yeah, I said that earlier. Ben Sien, Ben Yitzchak, which on the fourth of the year. And again, by Miriam Glazer, in honor of her mother's yard side, Frida, on the first of the year, which is the beginning of Rosh Chodesh. And um, uh, again, it should be a very healthy week, a healthy month, and a healthy year. It's an honor to sit here with you, and, uh, and I look forward to um, continuing our journey together. If you do want to get the Omer book, they're available here up front, and uh, again, any way we can help you, please let us know. Uh, myself, Velvo, Golda Malka, all of us here are here for each other. Everyone have a very pleasant night. Thank you.